Hi, this is Luke Brader. Um, I will be, in this video, I will be demoing another uh, 17th century braid with the unorthodox loop exchange that I uh, talked about my, and demoed in my uh, previous video. This one is for a um, braid that Joy Boutrip told me is, is sometimes referred to as the French string with open edges. Um, uh, I've called this type of edge uh, to a braid, uh, to a double braid, side slit, because it, let me move this camera a little bit, because it does have a slit or a flange, uh, it's, which she refers to as open edges, is a slitted edge to the uh, side of the double braid. So I'm spreading that, <laughs> it's hard to do with one hand, I'm spreading that slit open here, on, it's on each side. And it was a very common, it's a double braid, it's, it's going to be a 10 loop double braid. I often see, I've often seen in pictures of 17th century precious purses um, from the 17th century European little bags, purses that had this type of braid as a uh, carrying handle and pull string. These are very coarse, thick ones. Let me get the strap out of the way. Out of uh, that I made out of thick linen yarn, um, with a contrast uh, kind of a synthetic, shiny one. Here's one out of um, this was a uh, this is a thinner one. This might be about the size of some of them. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what the sizes were. This is silk and a uh, uh, ecru silk and a. Sorry about the focusing of this, it's automatic, it doesn't always come out, uh, silk and a gold rayon. It, it's fine, but you can see the side uh, can be separated, there, that's the slit on the side, what Noemi Spicer and Joy Boutrip call open, open edges, they're separated. And uh, this type of braid it's it, it's a double braid. It looks very similar to a, what I call a solid rectangle double braid, but the edges have that slit in them. Uh, I think it makes it look a little neater sometimes with the slit. I don't quite know why they often did it that way, but um, in any case, uh, that was a common braid shape for for those type of uh, purse strings. And um, often they were made with this... Uh, archaic, what I call archaic uh, loop transfer that I already demoed in the in the video for uh, for the Buck's Horn braid. However, this braid has a slightly different um, shape because of the open edges. So I will be demoing that here. I've started a sample here with fairly thick yarn, the linen, the, the coarse linen and a blue cotton. Um, I guess it doesn't stand out that differently, but it does make a pattern, these two colors. These are solid color loops, not bicolor loops. However, the French string is just a word for, a, and this braiding method is not a particular color pattern. It doesn't refer to a particular color pattern. It could be a solid color, like an all one color braid. It could have a pattern to it. The one that um, I'm demoing here is based on, uh, well anyway, the one that I, the pattern that I'm demoing here is, uh, f has four ecru loops, two on each edge, and six sky blue loops, or turquoise. Um, it's a ten loop braid. You can make this braid, or you can make a braid with open edges with a regular loop exchange, and I had never paid that much attention to which versions, the different braids I'd seen in museum pieces, pictures, I, not so much, I haven't gone and done museum research, but the photos that I've seen, museum photos, I hadn't really paid much attention before to whether they had the archaic loop exchange or the regular one, and then when somebody wrote me and wanted to learn, <laughs> wanted to reproduce a particular example in a Dutch museum, um, I kind of had to face up to that I've never really done the, I hadn't really, as a solo braider, or as any kind of, I hadn't really done the archaic version before, so I figured, finally figured, with Joy Boucher, uh 
corroborated that's what was going on in that the braid in the photo and so this is my I, I figured out a way to do it as a solo braider and this is a video demoing that way so to learn double braids I recommend going to my double braid tutorials all the all the moves all the other moves besides the loop exchange um, are covered in those although I haven't done side slit but the moves are covered in other braids, other double braids. So I will start here with these ten loops um, on the comb. So you start with symmetrical on the two sides. So I'm going to have two ecru loops on the left, um, followed by on the left hand, followed by three blue ones. I always load onto the fingers and then shift onto the thumb. Here come the three blue ones. Then on the other hand, same thing. So on the edge are the two E crews. This is just a starting setup. It, there are other possible starting setups for the same pattern. This seems like the easiest one to load uh, loops on in the beginning. Okay, so. I better move my cup. Move it some more. <clears throat> so, as I said, for this particular pattern, which the the braid can be have other patterns, um, I'm starting with two ecru loops on each edge, thumb and first finger, and six blue loops in the middle. The, the braid in the museum photo that um, the reader sent me was, uh, it had, I'm not sure what, what they were made out of, it was probably silk, but the um, the ecru loops, uh, they were white or ecru, and they were um, thicker than the, the contrasting color, which was a metallic, I believe silver, a metallic silver thread that was much, or quite a bit thinner. Um, so even though there were six metallic threads that were thinner in the braid, they were a smaller percentage of the braid than the than the four heavier ecru loops. I haven't really, I'm not copying that here. These are roughly the same size. Okay, so you start um, like this, and then the, the, the central uh, two transfers are going to be turned. You must turn you, you must do the turns as I am demoing, or do them exactly the opposite as I am demoing. Because the first turn, the first transfer is turned from above, but the uh, exchange, the loop exchange at the end will be in the opposite rotational direction, so that's kind of important for this structure. This braid is different from, differs from the, um, from the Buck's Horns braid because the outer loop transfer will not be turned. And that's a bit of a subtle difference when you see it here. I recommend going to my um, double braid tutorial videos to see exactly what the difference is. So I'm just going to braid it at first um, and then uh, show you the exchange. And then I'll go through the moves a little bit slower. So here comes, I did the transfers for the braid, and here comes the exchange. You tip your hands up, you set the um, right little finger loop onto the left little finger loop in this manner. So you, it gets a turn as you do this. And then you fish out the original little finger loop from that finger, out and from the low, out and over the loop you just placed on. Both loops get a turn, this loop came through the other loop. Tighten. I am at a far distance. This is not, of course, the way I normally braid. It's not convenient to have the braid attached at the far end of the table. I can't really see the fell of what I'm braiding, so it's, it's, I can't tighten well in this position, but you should be looking at your braid. It should be closer to you at the close end of the, of the table. I just do this to give a backdrop for the braid. And um, you should tighten with some consciousness because uh, the pattern can slip to the side one way or the other unless you pay 
I mean, that's, that's the case for any double braid, unless you pay a little bit of attention to how you tighten. I'm not able to do that uh, while I'm filming. Okay, so that was the first. Uh, that was the first uh, cycle of braiding moves. And now we go again. This this uh, braid has a ten cycle pattern repeat, but um, no, actually it is a five cycle pattern repeat since there's no bicolor loops. So that was no, that was cycle one. Here comes cycle two. I'll demo the slower. So I'm going through the first two loops, and then I'm going to take the middle finger loop from above, taking the top shank, which gives it a turn towards the other hand. Shift, shift, place. Now the second loop transfer on both hands is different from the buck's horn braid in that I go through the thumb loop. This is, I, I tip the loop I tip the hand towards the other hand to make it easier, through the thumb loop, through from behind the fing uh, first finger loop, and then I go through in the same manner, through the middle finger loop, to grab, the, to fetch the closest shank and bring it through the other two. That results in no turn, and then shift, shift, place. That results in no turn to this loop. The buckshorn braid had a turn to that loop. This one does not. That's what makes the open edges. So other side, second, second cycle, through, through two, turn from above, shift, shift, place, turn, through two, down into the um, middle finger loop with giving it no turn, shift, shift, place, then again tipping the hands upward to place the little finger loop onto the other finger with a slight turn and fishing the other loop out and around, giving that a slight turn, tighten. That's it. So um, here's the third, third cycle. No turn to the outer loop. Turn the inner loop. No turn to the outer loop the outer transfer up. You know, I don't know, you can say different things to yourself. It's really good to have a mantra when you braid. Excuse me, there we go. Um, so that you remember the important uh, parts. A mantra for whatever, whatever part is difficult for you to remember. So here comes the fourth cycle. That was with a turn. No turn. I usually count the cycles, so I'm usually saying four. Four to remind myself. Up, four down. Here comes five. Turn. Excuse me. Five. No turn. Five. Turn. Five. No turn. Exchange upward. Okay, so at five um, at five uh, cycles, I've, the loops have come back to the same color position that they were in the beginning. That's one pattern repeat. Let's take a look at this braid. So far away, I couldn't really see how the tightening was going. Bring it forward. Give a little tug here. I'm not sure how the focus is. Um, I don't know if you can see, but this braid, with this different kind of uh, loop exchange in the middle, you get a an irregularity that there's a central extra uh, row, column, it's called a ridge, braiding ridge. There's actually really, in a hidden way, there's two, but you can, it only one is really apparent. I think it's more apparent in the, in the buckshorn braid. And it's a bit different on the two sides. Um, it makes the braid a, a tad wider, a little more complicated looking in the middle than if you didn't do that um, unorthodox uh, loop exchange, if you did the regular one. Here, let me get the buckshorn example I made before. The buckshorn example sh has bicolor loops, and it really shows off the central extra ridge. This, those gold dots in the middle would not be there 
but for this um, unorthodox loop exchange. And on the other side, it's a bit different. It's And it is different physically. It's a different arrangement of the dots. They, uh, they don't show as much. And anyway, it's a, it's a it's physically a different over-under situation on the two, on the upper and lower surface of the braid going on. Um, here is an example. This is, I already made a video for this one, the buckshorn braid, but here I braided with bicolor loops. For this section that's all a, a single row of dots going down the middle, I braided with bicolor loops as for the buckshorn braid and all the loops with the same color up and the same color down. And I did the braiding moves for the French string with open edges. That ends up with this nice stripe in the middle. A bit different on the two sides. I'm sorry, the light is a bit dark here because of the way the sun is right now. I don't know if you can see that. Here here we go, the same thing further down. Uh, it's a nice it's a nice pattern. As far as I know this is not listed in the tradition in the seventeenth century manuscripts, but it's a perfectly natural extrapolation of the French string with open edges. It's how it turns out if you do it with bicolor loops, and having them all in one direction upward is quite an obvious pattern. Um, okay, so I guess that's about it. I might just keep, uh, let's see, what, where was that loop? Keep braiding a little bit, if you want to see the loop, the moves in um, more detail. Fix this. seems to have gotten tipped around. That's right. Okay, so um, let me get this knitting out of the way. We're back at the beginning section here. I hope this was all visible. Okay, again, turn from above, place, no turn. Turn from above, place, no turn, place, and then turn palms upward to effect this different loop trend, uh, loop exchange at the end. Turn from above, no turn, turn from above. Turn again, turn palms upward, place, and lift over. Now, I want to uh, just that's it. So, um, if, the, if the moves, if the braiding moves aren't clear, I do them in much those same braiding moves with a different loop exchange at the end are covered very carefully, um, the, both the turn and the no turn uh, in all my double braid tutorials that have been up for a long time. I'll put links to them below this video. Just just click on See More or something like that under the YouTube video and you'll get the links. Uh, traditionally, this I just want to point out that traditionally this braid would have been made by two people. This would have, One person would have been holding these five loops and a, and a person next to them would have been holding these five loops and they would be braiding as this off of one loop bundle cooperating, and um, when they exchange their loops, it looks much different than this, and also they would be doing the turns in the opposite direction. I mean, this it, it ends up with the same braid, um, but I find these moves easier to do this way with turning this up, and also anyway, the way that I turn, turn loops to the thumb specifically, when it does require a turn, I find it easier to do it this way, which ends up with the um, upper surface being what would be the lower surface if you braided this traditionally in a two-person team. It's totally possible to do it with this side upper. I just find the moves less friendly, so I do it this way. The braid is the same. It just is coming out upside down from how it would be if you braided it as a team, following the directions in um, Noemi Spicer and Joy Boutrip's works. 
the other uh, thing I want to point out that I didn't point out in the Buck's Horn braid is that um, this braid, these two braids are only described, as far as I know, in Noemi Spicer's Old English Pattern book, Books for Loop Braiding, because they are in they are in the 17th century manuscripts, and no other works that I know of, no other, nobody else has analyzed the 17th century manuscripts to the degree that Noemi Spicer has. They were very hard to decipher. She, uh, they made no sense really. The the text for them. She reverse engineered them by figuring out how the braids were done, and then uh, figuring out what what on earth they meant by the strange uh, ways they described them. Um, the method she came up with for doing the unusual loop exchange in the middle turned out not to be quite accurate. Um, it came up with the same, a very similar looking braid, but um, it was when it was when Joy Boutrip joined with her and some other people who were investigating uh, old, old loop braids, European loop braids, that Joy finally figured out the actual method that was used, which was actually easier than the one, the method Noemi Spicer had come up with. And that more accurate method is detailed in um, the four-part work that they, book that, or series of monographs that uh, Noemi Spicer and Joy Butcher put out together, um, European, loop braid, European Loop Braiding. Um, it was the first, the first one. Part one was the was the one on various loop exchanges, and that's where uh, Joy Boutrip detailed the actual way that she, there's even a historical photograph of three people in the process of doing this loop exchange from 1920s or 30s. It's quite amazing, and she kind of in, saw the examined the photographs and intuited and figured out the actual way that it was done, which was uh, more easier than the way Noemi Spicer had imagined it. And um, that's where you can find out how to do it as a uh, team of braiders. So this is my workaround. These two videos that I've done show my workaround method for making the same loop exchange as a solo braider. Okay. Thank you. And you can find out a lot more about it on my blog post. This, this, um, these videos are just, I just make them as adjuncts to the uh, posts on my blog. So I, now I will put these back on the comb, and thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'll get off the back.